we are really privileged, honored, delighted, I suppose is the main word, to have Mike Daisy here, uh, who will give a monologue. Uh, he is going to be doing, he's been doing all sorts of terrific things uh, recently, uh, the agony and the ecstasy of Steve Jobs, of course, but uh, after that, American Utopia is all over the country. And then, starting September 5th, September 3rd, September 5th, for every single day, he's going to do a new monologue called All the Faces of the Moon, doing a month-long new monologue at the Public Theater. Tickets go on sale right after July 4th weekend, and you would be crazy to miss any of those Faces of the Moon. So anyway, without further ado, here's Mike. We should begin by making it clear that I'm not qualified to be here. Um, that's actually essential to understanding everything that follows because um, sort of the essence of the gathering today generally involves qualified people because that is sort of the mise en scene when you're setting up a conference, uh, you know, a, a cabinet, a wonder cabinet of this kind. As, as you probably are well aware, you are the kind of people who would go. Uh, I can tell by the fact that you are here. And I saw some of you earlier and I felt the tenor of the room. And the tenor of the room was the tenor of a room full of people having a conversation they don't want to have, but they are the kind of people who are willing to go anyway, which puts them in a minority in the, the culture that we live in today. And, um, and, and, and the, the general tenor of the conversation, you know, was one of uh, expertness as people who know what the fuck they're talking about, one after another, would speak at length about the fact that they did understand what they were saying. Um, this is not to denigrate them least. I mean, I believe that they did. I believe they do know what they're talking about, and, and I heard it very clearly. And this presented a problem for me, uh, the monologuist, because as you can tell, having a title that is invented, uh, my job is largely fictitious. Uh, I, I am an artist, and uh, if you aren't aware, art is uh, uh, something uh, that is viewed with a sort of a mild antipathy by the dominant culture that we live in, uh, sort of like a distasteful, uh, like, like a side salad you never really wanted, but it came with the dish anyway, is sort of what art is in our age, if, if you didn't know. Um, but you probably do know because you're the kind of people who come to this conference. You're probably well versed in, in the, the intricacies of art. Um, you're in fact the, the engaged people, you know. What's interesting, of course, is that we're having this conversation and, and we've all uh, alluded to, and a, a point that has been elided a number of times, is that there's this huge unspoken mass uh, um, you know, sort of like the dark matter of the universe, you know, like a giant ball of neutrinos out there, uh, something that is hanging over the earth. Those people who are not here are in fact the people who are, you know, in the system. Like I suspect a large number of people here are going to have living wills, or if they don't have living wills now, they'll be getting them later. Um, uh, probably after they finish up here, they'll go home. Because you seem like good people who follow the rules. You'll probably uh, make arrangements and think about the nature of your death. Um, I'm maybe here to provide counterpoint, because I won't uh, do that. I'm going to leave, and I'm going to try to forget I was here. Uh, I'm going to try to erase most of what happened today, because, you know, it was unpleasant, and um, the conversation was not comfortable for me. And uh, it made my wife very uncomfortable, uh, which makes a lot of sense, because I am professionally fat. And as a professionally fat person, um, I'm going to die. You know, I mean, we're all actually going to die, a point that's been hammered home again and again and again and again today, uh, with a lot of uh, ceaseless regularity for a culture that, that hates it, but we are apparently all the people who love to talk about death. Uh, we're all going to die. Uh, the point of being a professionally fat person is that I am that which will die before you. So sort of like all those jokes where people are being chased by a bear, you know, all these bear chasing jokes. If you've ever gone up to Canada, they love these fucking bear chasing jokes. There's a whole school of bear chasing jokes and all of them basically, if you boiled them down to their essence, the essence of every uh, bear chasing joke is uh, you're running with someone else. You don't need to outrun the bear. I just need to outrun this guy I'm with. And then the bear presumably eats that person. There, there's a whole universe. The Canadians don't have a deep sense of humor, but they do. They do have a lot of verisimilitude in one area, and that would be these bear jokes. Um, so there's a huge variety of them, but really all of them revolve around someone else. Uh, so the bear catching the other person. Um, 
the idea is that I will die before you. And so if you anthropomorphize death, and I think a lot of us do even if we don't admit it to ourselves, uh, if you think of death as a force out there to be evaded, something to be um, cheated perhaps even, uh, or at least maybe have its form scrambled so it doesn't quite arrive exactly when it thought it was going to, that perhaps you could take a certain pill or have one of those proton beams shot through you in an enormous machine the size of an entire building. If all those things could be done and give you just a few more weeks perhaps because the beam's protons have scrambled death's address book and it can't quite find you at that moment. <laughs> that would be not such a bad thing. That's what I think people think. And in that way of thinking, it can occur to you that perhaps, perhaps if you are surrounded by a, a sufficient number of uh, fat people, that they will take up death's time before you. I, I find that people in our culture hate fat people with a, a really an intensity that people who've never been fat really don't, uh, like, they really hate fat people. And, um, uh, uh, and it's an interesting thing to experience. And one of the things it teaches you, though, is that one of the areas that they, um, that they enjoy fat people is the, the very certain knowledge that they'll, they'll die first. Um, they like that. Um, people find it kind of soothing, in a way. You know, like, you're a short, you're not here for long, uh, as they will often say. My, my wife doesn't like that very much because she has this idea that we will grow old together and that I will not be, will not be dead. Um, um, uh, and, and, and as a consequence of it, uh, it's, it's like a strong neurosis for her. So she's very often talking endlessly about my death. And I already kind of obsess about my death quite a bit because I'm a little uh, loosely affixed to this earth. And so as a consequence, I kind of long for death. So it's really a great dining room conversation. <laughs> Um, it's just delightful because because I'm already kind of loosely attached and she's sort of like you're gonna die and I'm like god I hope so and um, you know as a consequence it's just um, uh, uh, so what I'm saying is the whole the whole afternoon really like sort of um, you know it's sort of like a hot red hot poker just in our genitals, not in, a, not in a good way, not in a provocative way where we'd asked for it and we were ready for it and it was something we were into, but more, more like a conversation we hadn't been ready to have, but there was no excuse. I mean, the very name of the event itself, the All Day Symposium, the whole nature of it, I'd been really excited about it for weeks. I'd been very, very excited about it. Um, I was very excited until, until I read the press release and found out that I was performing the world premiere of a new monologue, at which point I was like, really? I thought I was just giving some remarks, and this is part of the problem with being a monologuist, is because there's a very loose definition of what it means to actually perform something. You know, if you um, if you create uh, uh, operettas, if you if you compose, it's a very you know, because you have to get a bunch of other people to assist you in your lunacy. You're going to have a good idea whether you finish something or not, and what it's worth. And sadly, because of the nature of my art form, it is sort of by its nature, by design half-baked. And so as a consequence, you know, it's very hard to tell uh, if, you know, whether something is the thing that you say it is. You know, is, it, is this truly a monologue today or is this going to be a one act, as you would say in the theater, although all the monologues are in fact one acts, because if you let people leave at an intermission during a monologue, this is a professional secret, they do not come back. <laughs> uh, something I've learned. Uh, is that you need to trap them there. You need to trap them there and not allow them to leave. It's like one of the powers of the theater is that you, you use the spatial coordinates you have, the fact that they are trapped in a room. It becomes part of the ouvre. You know, you, really, it's, it's part of the whole experience is that you can't leave. You're experiencing that right now. Some of you are already thinking, boy, this isn't quite what I expected it to be, and I understand. I'm feeling the same way. One of the... Um, one of the brighter spots in the afternoon was the, um, the they were talking about the idea that um, they were talking about the idea that all people are either natives or strangers, which I think is a fantastic idea. Um, it's really, really true. And as an artist, your job as an artist is actually to be a stranger as much as possible uh, in your own culture. Like what you're supposed to do um, is 
estrange yourself from the world around you in an effort to then see it more clearly. Because when you're a stranger to things, they, you don't recognize them, you know? And perhaps this is the area where I could actually be of some use, because I'll tell you, it's not gonna be through familiarity with these issues. I am a terrible choice to be in tonight's event. I am um, I am too young. Um, I'm not actually experiencing the generational crack up that we are all discussing. I'm, I'm, I'm younger. I'm not a baby boomer. Um, uh, um, um, I, 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 both my parents are alive, uh, but are not yet, um, you know, that they in fact are baby boomers. So uh, maybe we could have gotten one of them to perform. So uh, I'm in this odd position where I'm like a little too young, but I'm not really that, I'm not terribly young, uh, but, uh, but I'm too young to talk about this, which just indicates how much life extension we're getting. Because this is like, the, this is the only time recently where I've been feeling like I'm too young to talk about this. It's not, not happened to me that often, actually. I, I usually feel very old because in our, our culture, really oriented around, you know, ideally, um, well, it's really like a barely legal culture. Like really, ideally, you are 19 or like 18 in a few months and you're like I don't know if I can drink like that's where you're supposed to be uh, forever um, to really be at the peak of our culture uh, but when I was at that age when I was uh, 18 and a little bit um, it was the last time that I was studying bioethics before today um, because I went to college uh, I went to college and at college uh, our introductory freshman reading they were like what would be really provocative for the fresh they had this thing where all the freshmen would read a book together I mean you would read it over the summer before you got there not that we would arrive and then all read it together although that would have been really an interesting exercise. Um, we would all read over the summer a book, and then we would all arrive and discuss the book. And as you might imagine, uh, people haven't gone to college yet. This is probably your best chance to get people to actually read a book, because they have not yet figured out the tenor of the institution you're going to. And I was going to a small micro Ivy college, which I was at under a scholarship. And so I did not actually understand that this college that I couldn't have gone to under my own means, and I, I thought of as like an academic mecca that would change everything everything, was really the place that a lot of people who lived just outside of Boston were going to because they had not gotten into Harvard, and then they did not get into their safety school, and they were here. So there was a lot of people who had gone to the right schools, wh whose names I didn't even know about until I got there because I was so disconnected from this whole uh, infrastructure of jackets and badges and I don't know what the fuck else. I had no idea that the school I was going to was actually like, um, you know, it was like, it's okay, but it was going to be like... Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I read the book with a lot of intensity because I was like, I've got to be ready to discuss these bioethics issues. And so I really poured myself into it. And then I arrived, and, you know, we had all these breakout sessions to discuss the book, and it rapidly became clear that no one had read the book. No one had read. This was my first sign about my college. Because no, I was like, really? Because I sort of imagined it was like going to be more like we all fought to get here. So I had, I had just bathed in this book. And I cannot remember the title of the book. It made such an impression on me. Um, I do remember that the entire book, it was like a, like a general, almost like a general overview of bioethics issues. So it, it ranged over the whole world of bioethics. And it really says something about my compositional makeup at this magical age of 18 in a few months, the core of what our culture is about, the issue I was most into was cloning. I wanted to talk about cloning all the time. And I was, you bet you can't guess, I was totally in favor of cloning. And I thought we should have no restrictions on research of any kind. In fact, I was like, if we could do a kind of research that would also involve killing a few extra embryos, that would be awesome. I was just like, no, more, more. I was just like, Wah! I was strongly in favor of, uh, you know, re really, I was like, because I had visions in my head of like pulp adventure. I wanted like, I wanted like scientists to be grafting robot hands onto, you know, monster bodies and stuff. I, I, you know, so there are parts of the book that were very clearly about the issues we have been discussing today, but they had no, they had no impact in me. In the same way today, I feel very far from a lot of these generational issues. I feel like there's a gap there. The gap is even further from even where I am today. When I view myself back at 18, I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with you? I mean, I remember reading them, but I think the words must have just bounced off the impenetrable force field of my own self-regard. And I found that to be true of all, you know, when we had the discussions, because of course no one read the book, but people are always willing to discuss. And, um, <laughs> I mean, like, we're all here, right? Um, and what I found from the discussions is um, uh, 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 um, 
everybody, every, you know, it's a real, you can't discuss biomedical ethics about end of life issues with 18 year olds because they know for a certainty that they will live forever. So it, it really fucks up the entire universe. It's like, yeah, right, like a good death would be if I was naked in a corn thresher. <sighs> And I think I made that suggestion, that that would be an awesome way to die. And I mean, I've really visualized it. I would be in a cornfield, and it'd be dawn. The sun would be coming up, and it would be lightning along the horizon, and there'd be one corn thresher. It'd be like a Michael Bay film, and like explosions in the distance. And the, the corn thresher's coming towards me, maybe some music playing, underplaying, and then the camera kind of pans around, and I'm there. And I'm in kind of a Jesus pose, but not like a strong Jesus, but like a semi-Jesus. I'm just like, oh. And the corn thresher's coming up on me, so cut to the corn thresher, cut to me, cut to the corn thresher, cut to me and then um, we don't actually see the moment that the corn thresher consumes me well, there's just maybe maybe a oh a crow like on a scare like and, and, and then maybe a spatter of blood that's what we would say because of course that would that's what we want or what I would want right because the unpleasant thing would be like well the first blade bisects my I wouldn't want that because that would be painful so I guess I'm actually wishing even though I'd like it to be dramatic I'm actually wishing for the same death we've all been wishing for all day long which is this sort of mythological death that is instantaneous and painless which is uh, fascinating because I don't know how quickly you think but I think really fast. I mean, I've been impressed by that. And when I'm afraid of something, I think even faster. So I think it would have to be a surprise corn thresher for me. <laughs> because honestly, if I have even a moment to think about it, if I woke up in the middle of the night and I was like, ah, and I didn't have that magical defibrillator button that we've all been promised that will be built into my heart, like, soon, probably very soon, because I've just finally started going to doctors again, so I'm sure they're going to be like, with your enormous weight, Mr. Daisy, we've got to put five of them in you, we've got a whole suit, and I'll be like, great, great, and I'll, have them, I'll let them do everything to me, I'll be like, I'm soaking up all the resources, because I'm going to die sooner, so I need to use it up now, so I get my lifetime amount right now, I'll have a whole suit of the fucking things, at parties, I'll be able to throw electric darts at people, the, um, the thing about this mythological death that's interesting is that it's so mythological. Like, if I woke up in the middle of the night because I was dying, we'll never be able to interview me to know for sure. But I have woken up at the start before, and usually when I wake up at the start, my first thought is, I'm dying, <laughs> is usually what I feel like. Maybe you're different, I don't know. But if I wake up with like a sudden, uh, I, I've had the experience sometimes, uh, we, have a, we have a dog, a small black pug, and he is getting a little older, although he's still fairly agile, uh, but uh, not at night, he's a very good sleeper. And so sometimes he just falls out of the bed. Um, and when he does that, he, although he looks like a cat, he is not like a cat, and he just falls. You know, he just falls like a sack of bricks, like a sack of pug. And he hits the ground with this noise that will wake you up. And when it wakes me up, I think, I'm dead! And, but then I'm like, no, I'm not. And I get an immediate rush of endorphins because I'm like, still alive, still alive. But I would imagine when I die, if it was this good way, it will be like that without the endorphins. Instead, my last thought would be like, I'm dying! And then I will die. And um, I, I think it's really interesting that, I mean, I don't think that sounds very pleasant. I actually think the longer death with some time to figure out how I feel about it, it sounds like more work, but it actually sounds like it has a higher chance of actually ending in some sort of peaceful, like my ideal death, if I can't have the corn thresher, is more like um, Yoda. It's like Yoda, I want to like say goodbye, I want to train the last Jedi, and then I want to know that it's going to work out. Then I'm going to get, and I want to be kind of old and be like, and I want to speak all elliptically. And then uh, once I finish my last elliptical speech, I'll be like, so tired. And I'll pull up my, my blanket, and then I will just like, and I will just uh, evanesce into the, into the force, and then later appear to people as glowing as glowing, um, glowing ghosts to people. And later, when a series of terrible prequel movies are made, uh, my memory will be abused and, and raped repeatedly. But, you know, it, but what I want is the moment from that one movie, Return of the Jedi, where before all the raping happens, I just want to like have that death and not have my memory raped later. Um, that would be, for me, that would be a very good death. Maybe we could, we could probably combine both of them, like maybe the corn thresher, and then as the blades come toward me, Maybe that would be best, to have both the theater and, and all the different parts of it. 
The next time I studied bioethics, that was really the only time was that week. And uh, like I'm saying, the discussions don't bear repeating because they weren't terribly interesting. Um, um, yeah, there's this wonderful idea, you know, like these, these are kids, they're the future. They should discuss things. That's not true. Um, there are some discussions that are a lot better to have at different ages. You know, they're just, they're just better. You know that. You know that right now because you're like, couldn't we have gotten a baby boomer to talk about these issues? Why is he? He's so young. He's so young and he's pointless. And I understand. I understand how you feel. I feel very similarly. Um, but uh, the next time I did discuss bioethics issues with any depth, it was the turn of the century. Um, in the, the last time the century turned, not the time before that. Um, and um, I was working at uh, Amazon.com, um, where I was working in business development, which was a job that consisted mostly of having lunch. Um, I would have lunch a number of times a week with a variety of people. And then you spent most of your day like sort of plotting when you would go to lunch and when you come back and, and figure out how to input the fact that you were going to lunch into your Palm Pilot which at the time, you know, was very the hot thing. And so in a way, by living on the edge of the future, it was like being in the future because now we have these device, you know, so it's like the same, it's really the same, except it was in black and white and it didn't uh, sync properly. So you, you really like always thought like, I, there's got to be a way to get my outlook to tell me that I'm going to lunch. I'll just type it all in my hand. And I would type, and I remember very vividly typing in things with a stylus by hand, you know, that morning, as I'm going to lunch, I'm like, I know I'm fucking going. Why am I doing And I like, <laughs> laboriously type it all in. But it made sense, because there was a real cult of love about technology there, you know, as you might imagine. It was Amazon, and we believed sincerely that we were changing the nature of commerce forever. When in reality, we were building, you know, it was Kmart, but it was, was on the internet. And, um, uh, and, and the bioethical issue that I discussed there, that I remember it was 1999, this was the first time, the first time, though certainly not the last, that I heard about the singularity. Now, if you haven't heard about the singularity, you are so lucky that this is the only time you're gonna hear about it. Because seriously, if you live in certain circles, if you are uh, a white male who uh, lived in the Pacific Northwest with a lot of like programming people around you, or if you spent too much time in the Bay Area uh, um, um, within the in the wrong crowds, then you hear about the singularity a lot. You even hear about it today. Like it's it's like an ongoing concern. The singularity is a belief system that um, that in particular atheists love, and the belief system works like this: technology is awesome. It's totally awesome and it keeps getting better all the time. And it keeps getting much better. At this point, usually there's a PowerPoint chart with a bunch of charts of how fast technology is going, and usually going upward very quickly. Then they show all of those and they say, you can see by it going so quickly that it's no doubt that eventually we will build a computer that is so intelligent that it will be intelligent enough to know how to make itself more intelligent. That's the spark. Because once we have a computer that's intelligent enough to make itself more intelligent, it will bootstrap itself, right? Like it will just start, it'll be like, I want to be more intelligent. And the computer will make itself more and more and more intelligent. And it'll get more and more intelligent. And then that computer will be more intelligent than any human can even imagine being. That's the end. <laughs> I know, you're, you're like, because it's funny. Because when you tell it to normal people, they're often like, and then it kills us all? Because it, it actually sounds like the beginning of a terrible movie, right? Like, and then it's like, eradicate. The, it's actually how the Terminator movies begin, basically, is that you know, a computer decide, becomes self-aware and then like, is like, get rid of the humans. Um, but you know, for whatever reason, and there are a couple of them, in this era, when, you're, when you love technology enough, you actually don't think that's bad. You're actually like, that's awesome. Because what it means is that these hyper-intelligent machines, and they're going to take care of everything, and they're going to be much more intelligent than we are, so much more that we're like ants to them. And so therefore, follow me, they're, so much, they're actually more worthy of being alive than we are. So they're going to do stuff, and either they'll eradicate us, but hopefully not, right? Because they're so intelligent, they'll probably like us. And they're just going to take care of everything. This is the part that's really fuzzy. Because people are always like, well, what do you mean? Well, it'll, they'll be so intelligent, they'll cure cancer. They'll, it won't be cancer because, very, and this they get to very quickly, all our bodies will be destroyed and will be uploaded. 
And you're like, upload into what? We can't imagine because the computers will invent it. Like we could imagine a sort of a construct, but it's not going to be as cool as the thing. It's going to be like, a, like my lame version of the Thresher thing. It's going to be much better than that. Like when this exists, I'll be able to like dictate, I'll be like, build me a corn Thresher, let it come toward, and I'll be able to do all that. And it'll have the resolution will be amazing. And we'll all be able, it'll be real. And we can have as many deaths as we want because we're going to live forever. You're like, oh, you're gonna live for, and they're like, yes, it's a big point with the people who love the singularity is that everybody gets to live forever because they'll be uploaded in the giant machine and then everything will be a simulation uh, inside the machine with the super intelligent computers and then we will just live forever. It'll be totally awesome. The most interesting thing about the singularity uh, is first that it, it, it is a belief system that evolved from and is espoused mostly by techno libertarians. So that it's uh, really built around, because when you ask about like sort of social issues, it's actually a great reason not to solve any. Like I know a lot of singularity people who are like, well, we don't have to solve racism because we're gonna be uploaded soon. And you're like, I'm not gonna, we don't have to solve, you know, there are many social ills that you can sort of like sweep under the rug if you're like working on a, you know, your short timing, you're basically running out the clock. You're like, well, don't worry about that. We're all gonna be gone from here in like 20 years or something, so I don't know, just, I don't know, fix it or don't, I don't really care. Um, and then there's the question of like, well, does everyone get uploaded? Like, and they're always like, yeah, sure, sure. There's a lot of hand waving, you know, sort of like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. And what they mean by I don't know is I don't care, I don't care, I couldn't care in the least. <laughs> as long as I am uploaded, I, I, I don't care. And so um, I, I remember in 99, people discussing bioethics issues, very specifically being like, oh, extend my life. Extend my life as long as you don't you pull the plug. Because when the singularity comes, whatever's, even if my brain is mush, they will reconstruct What's, they, will, they will make me perfect. Everything's in there. Don't throw me out. People are talking about it like they're in, they're in somebody's leftover fridge. They're like, don't throw me out. Keep me there because I'm, gonna be, I'm coming back and just like keep me alive. And they were deadly, deadly serious about it. The most interesting thing about the singularity is that it's the techno-libertarian version of the rapture, of course. It's the same, same argument except that it doesn't involve uh, God. But it's the same deus ex machina argument. You don't actually need to solve the problems of the world because the world isn't actually that important because there's a world to come that is coming. It'll arrive soon, but we cannot know when. Although I guess with the singularity you can be like, read Wired for clues as to when it's coming. <laughs> You know, but it's basically the same, you know, like when it shows up, it will like, there'll be a great wind and the horns will trumpet and the good people, or, you know, in the Singularity's case, the people are the most connected, the people with the largest number of tweets and a really active Foursquare account, those people get uploaded first and, you know, you know people who are going to live events and listening in real time like you are, are probably going to be left behind. So I found Arthur Kaplan's argument this afternoon um, that we should get rid of all the research uh, funding. Um, I found it tremendously persuasive because it had something in it that, that I don't have in my argument, which is facts. And I thought that was, <laughs> I thought it was tremendous because I don't have any facts. I have, uh, you know, because I, because I, I just told you all the research I've done on bioethics, and it, like that was it. That wasn't like it wasn't like I'll pick out some great moment. I was like I only have two. I have two, and then this afternoon, so now I have three. Um, so I, I loved how there was like, you know, it, it was as though he had dedicated a lifetime to his work, and then you read his bio, and you're like, oh, well, that explains it. He's re he really, when, they, when people dedicate their lives to things, they really have the facts at their disposal. As someone who's a professional dilettante, um, I, I, I can tell you, more often than not, you know, I, I, I have no facts. Um, I, have, I have very few facts. Uh, the, the facts are a cloud around me. Um, uh, because uh, I, I am, by, by my job, is to be this sort of mirror. You know, my job is sort of to be outside, and then try to pull together things to try to say something, anything, that might not actually directly follow from what you've seen. So I thought Arthur did a fantastic job of what he was talking about, but, um, but there was something that I thought was interesting, and it came up in the questions afterwards, which was, you know, his proposal overall was we need to cut off all the funding. We need to cut off the funding from the research. And, um, and, in the, and that seemed like a very radical proposal. But by the time he was done, it was clear when you're really thinking about the armature of the machine, of the corporatized machine that does all the research that makes the medical industry what it actually is. I mean, 
it wouldn't actually even slow it down that much. And in fact, that was brought up by people in the crowd. If you were here, you may remember. And they brought that up, and Arthur's response was sort of like, well, it'll slow it down a little bit. It seemed like, almost like the bear argument, right? Like, let's slow it down a little bit. I'll catch someone else first, and we'll get away. It's like, because, because clearly, even Arthur doesn't actually believe it would stop because it's big business. And so from that, you know, the, 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 an idea started like really percolating for me, and that idea was a, kind of a, well, it's a simple one in some ways, but, but, uh, but I, I, I'd like to draw it through, and I'd like to propose that maybe Arthur isn't actually being radical enough, that his proposal, while seeming so Swiftian, maybe it doesn't go far enough in the sense that it doesn't address the fact that maybe this, this entire medical industry, end of life care problem, maybe it is not a problem. Well, thank you. <laughs> I, and I say that because maybe it's not a problem because it is actually working as it was designed to do. Um, one of the speakers this afternoon was talking about the rise of ICUs in the 70s and how after the rise of intensive care units, you know, now we have this ability to, um, to give people incredible levels of care. And that was when the first respirator showed up. And within a year, you know, this, uh, you know the, uh, a case rose that brought everything to a head where you actually start discussing what are we going to do about people where we can keep their bodies alive, even though it would appear that they the soul or the spirit or just their consciousness has departed and then debate about whether they have departed or not. All those things started to assert themselves after the technology made it possible. You know, I spent a lot of my life working in, in, in and around technology. And um, that's sort of technology's job. You know, technology at its core is uh, a branch of the first technology, which of course was fire, which if you aren't familiar with it, is hot and it will burn you which is sort of the, the essence of all technology sort of springs from that, where it's this exciting, uh, transformative thing. It's a technology. Uh, we learned how to make it. We learned how to maintain it. Um, it's tremendously destructive, and, 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 but tremendously transformative. You know, fire is the force that uh, burns through things, creates heat and light, and then as it passes, transforms the things that have been burned but are left behind. And technology often functions the same way, you know? Imagine what this room would be like if it was not now with our technology. Like, you are all cyborgs. I, I saw you earlier in the sessions. Everyone has a smartphone. Thank God. I can actually feel the quality of your attention dipping and waving. It's fascinating compared to a traditional theater. It's a little bit like riding on a rocking boat. Because any moment that I'm not absolutely holding you, then you can, like, check your sports scores or figure out where you're going to go have dessert later. You know, like, there's a whole world going on um, between you and the phones, because you don't know this, but if you darken the room, which we've done, when you turn on the phones to look, um, the person who's performing can actually see the light on your face. So you can actually see the Lord is sort of like sprinklings of lights coming on and off, and people always think they're being so subtle. You can tell because they're kind of doing it like this. <laughs> Especially now, I would imagine, now even more than ever they would be doing it. But that just speaks to, you know, this, uh, the technology is now a tool, right? And it's woven through us. It's woven through our consciousness at enormous speed, you know. Just five or six years ago, there weren't really smartphones, not like there are now. There weren't really web browsers that people had. And now they're everywhere, and everyone has one, especially the everyone that's in this room. Um, the transformative nature of that, you know, makes, makes one wonder if specifically... It, it, if you think about the nature of corporations and the nature of corporatism, if the goal of corporatism is to create these entities called corporations and they exist to be self-perpetuating, it's like the biggest thing about a corporation is that it doesn't die. You know, like that old uh, H.P. Lovecraft, that which is eternal doesn't die. It doesn't die. It never goes away. It lives forever. That's the point of a corporation is actually to be larger than us. When we first invented them, that was the point. Because originally, the way that corporations worked is you got to get a charter to have a corporation because the idea is that no group of people would get together to make a corporation unless they had fucking something to do. So you would, you'd you be like, oh, we got to build this bridge, but it's too big for us to do. We, we should form a corporation. So you'd form a corporation in order to do a task like trade with the East Indies or build a bridge. And originally, corporate charters would outline 
uh, the terms of how that bridge was going to be built, what was going to be done, who was going to be involved, and the terms of its dissolution, which is such a foreign concept now. But like in your charter would be the terms under which you would have decided that this particular corporation had done its job and was finished. That part's gone now. <laughs> we don't do that anymore. Corporations are actually um, very, by design now, open-ended like completely open-ended. They grow and grow and grow and they get as large as possible because they have no arc like we do, you know? We have this arc in our lives. We are born, we live, and we die. And that gives a shape to our days and nights. And you can actually see this division in our lives all around us, like the, there are the things that follow the human arc. There are small businesses. There are things that, that, that are designed on a human scale that have a natural beginning, middle, and ending. And then there are entities that are aligned with the idea that they should be eternal, uh, corporations, institutions. And the problem with eternity is that it is a really long time and that it is inherently alienating from the experience of being human. It's the experience of being human is the experience of, um, of what we've been discussing all day. It's the experience of having a human experience as you go through life, an experience of changing as the ages take you. As the seasons turn for you, you change inside of you. And as you change, you learn. Like that's, that's actually such an essential part. It's like the root of being a human being is going through those seasons. I'd submit that maybe the system is not broken because maybe the system is not built for us. Maybe the reason there is a system is that the system is built for corporations. It's actually constructed as that. And if viewed through that lens, it's not a broken system at all. It works well. It works very well. Because the individuals who are living inside the system, and if you'll spare me a, a terrible analogy, uh, but I mean, it's one I can't help but make because of my age and where I live in time. It's a little bit like the, the Matrix. You may recall the Matrix, the seminal 1999, same period I'm having these discussions at Amazon, uh, science fiction film, uh, filled with lots of Sartrean allegories, has two really terrible sequels, which if you have not seen them, please just don't even watch them. But the original film is actually quite lovely, and it has a one absurd element in it, uh, in terms of the mythology of the film, which is when they're like, well, why? Why do all the, why your world got taken over by, by, by computers? Uh -huh, uh -huh, singularity. They took over the world, and then they made all the humans, they left the humans alive, because the humans are batteries. And in one really cheesy scene, um, uh, 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 Lawrence Fishburne holds up a battery. And it's like, batteries. You know, and the audience, at least if it was my audience, uh, laughed at him. Uh, because that, that idea is kind of stupid. But it's actually a pretty good metaphor for how it works here. Because the thing about having these humans available to you is that a normal human in this system where the corporations exist to take money from them, they need the humans to perceive themselves as consumers, and they need them to buy shit and, and, and buy shit from corporations and then be sufficiently distracted by the buying of shit that they do not think about their place in the system. What would be even better, though, would be if, if a lot of humans had a thing that they could buy where they could buy a lot more than the actual amount of money they have. And we, we had that, and it was like subprime lending. Like we've worked our way through a lot of different systems, but healthcare is the best one. Because I would argue healthcare is actually a hack in the system. Because the, the, the thing that healthcare touches on is actually a primal human thing, the need to live the desire to live. That's why all of these efforts to create rules, to create a, a document ahead of time that will describe how you will die, that's why they always fail. They have to always fail because death is this um, uh, unpierceable mystery in many ways. Like we will obviously feel very different at the moment of our death than we do drinking that a theoretical glass of wine, you know, a year, two years, 10 years before and we're discussing it abstractly, of course we feel differently. We're human, we're human. In many ways, you could argue all of us are going through life in an effort to figure out how to best live that final death, how we will have a good death. But the Greeks talk about that, that the entire life can be a prelude just to actually having a good death, naked in front of the corn thresher. 
or whatever your you know your belief system is. I'm assume you don't share mine. Um, maybe you do. I don't know. I'll see you out there in the cornfields. But the um, the the heart of this though is that where the hack comes in is that you have this thing, life, that is in fact priceless. It's priceless to people. People will pay anything to keep a child alive. They will pay anything because it breaks the value of money. It's a thing that does not have a price. That's powerful because you can use it for good, which is you can set it outside the field of, of money but in our world today, money permeates everything. And so since it is inside the field of money, it is a variable that can be used to break systems. Because as you may be aware, when you divide things and multiply things by zero, you get some fucked up results. <laughs> and that's why you can charge people an unlimited amount of money to do things, especially if you're not charging them. You're using them as batteries to charge the entire culture. Like, they're conduits for you to charge the culture for the thing you want to do. They don't feel it personally. Because if they felt it personally, they would run out of money. Like, the reason they do this isn't because, isn't because out of some great goodness on the corporation's part. It's because it's actually conduit to more money. There are many people dying today whose annual incomes are quite low, who then in the last six months of life will cost more than they made in the last 10 years of their life. That happens constantly. That's good for the corporations that are feeding off those systems. Like, that works out extremely well for them. The people have never been more profitable like, than when they're lying in those, in those hospital rooms. And you can see, once you use that lens, everything we've talked about lines up. Like, everything makes sense. It makes sense that the system encourages people to stay in, to stay in ICU. It encourages everyone to get as much help as possible. And it's not because any human involved in the system has uh, terrible motives. It is because all the humans within the system are suborned almost as though they're in a matrix. I'm sorry, it's terrible. <laughs> I've been suborned, it's really terrible, I really apologize. But the, all the humans have been suborned because they're working within a framework that is corporatist, and the corporatist framework wants more than anything else to channel that money into corporations. Um, you know, Arthur spoke earlier about Steve Jobs and, um, and how Steve Jobs flew to Kentucky, and, uh, and in fact, got residence in Kentucky. Uh, or Tennessee, and he, and he got residents there um, uh, in order to then uh, 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 get a liver transplant, which, uh, which increased his life. You know, if everyone was a billionaire, that could be the system. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm serious, like that would also be a viable, the corporation would be in that, if everyone had the money to pay, they'd be happy to take the money. But it's actually more profitable for it to come out of the public coffers. Like it's more profitable to um, help everyone as much as possible because at the moment there's unlimited amounts of money coming out of that. You know, Apple's ahead of the pack right now. Um, they just got investigated by Congress. They had hearings about their tax uh, strategies, which uh, were called um, the most Byzantine and disturbing that they that they'd ever heard of um, by by the Congressional Budget Office. And one of the things that one of the assertions they made that kind of went under the radar that people haven't thought about a lot is that one of Apple's assertions about why it was paying so little taxes on it, you know it currently has over a hundred billion dollars in cash, just a giant ball of money that I can't figure out what to spend on. Um, I'm not even being facetious. I mean, literally, it's a problem in their investing world. Like, there's so much money that they have. It's more liquid cash than the US government has, and they don't know what to spend it on uh, because it's hard, I guess. And you wouldn't want to spend it on workers or something like that. So they're just like holding it. So this giant ball of money um, that they have, uh, um, um, one of the ways they've evaded taxes to accumulate the giant ball of money is by saying, well, we sell a lot of these products in other countries. So money that comes from other countries, uh, that's money, that's ca that money doesn't necessarily have to come back to America. And this is actually kind of a radical, it's the first expression of an ongoing argument that people have been making, which is a multinational corporation saying, I'm truly multinational. Not just that I am in many nations, but that I am in and above these nations, that I am in a sense an extra state entity. Like, I gave them their money, I don't owe anything to America, what do you think this is, the place I come from? And you know, America would be like, yeah, you're based out of here. And at a certain tipping point, Apple will say, well, maybe we'll leave. You better let us do it or we'll fucking leave and we could go anywhere and anyone would love to have us. Like it's an interesting back and forth and it's right on the edge of like what corporations are capable of.
And so the things that 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 we're terrified of, that that Arthur himself said, you know, were not conceivable, like rationing and uh, restrictions, these things that 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 seem like they can't possibly be on the table. They are in the future, right? Because like uh, this system, the beautiful thing about corporations is that they are very, very good at executing, but they have no vision, right? Like they're actually compelled by their nature to keep taking all this money. They actually can't stop themselves from doing it. They'll keep gorging and gorging and gorging until the system is broken. And when the system gets broken, the way in which it will get broken is it will get broken with, with, with rationing, with restrictions, like something will have to give. And it will probably have to give, given how we've been handling healthcare so far, in some awful, weird, broken kind of way. And, um, and this gives me a lot of hope. Because the truth is, the truth is that buried in the seeds of that is an opportunity for a kind of radicalism. Because the thing about corporations, the thing that makes them weak, the reason why the world isn't going to end up like the Matrix or the Terminator, is these things aren't actually machines. They're actually made of people. Like human beings live inside of corporations. Like human beings have to make a choice to go work at and live inside a corporation. And when things get bad enough, those are the things that can actually wake up a populace. And so it's not a pleasant thing to contemplate, but when you're talking about rationing and restrictions, when you're talking about deciding that people over a certain age um, will have to be left to fend for themselves, these are the kind of issues that can galvanize a people to a place that they aren't actually in now, that they haven't been in in my lifetime. And if those things become inevitable because of the way the corporations are working through and feeding off of them, uh, it brings things to a head in a way where at least the conversation can start being had. The problem is where we live today might not be that time. Like you might need things to get worse before they actually might start getting better because it's very hard to imagine how you can adjust the system from inside when it looks like that. I know the people that will follow me will talk about what it is to make a personal good death, what that might be. Um, I've already put out my corn thresher idea. Um, I would like to end. I, I would like to end this by saying I think that I'm always interested in context, and I think that um, it's really notable that like we're here tonight and we're having this conversation. It's being recorded, you know. It will stream over the interweb, and like others will view it. You know, maybe eighty. I don't know how many people will view it. You know, it'll be out there, embedded in people's web pages or whatnot. And we're having this conversation, and we talk about these things often like they're distanced, but they're not distanced. I mean. If you followed what's been happening at NYU, if you followed the protests and the way that this institution has been dealing with corporatization and becoming suborned by it, I mean, it's not surprising. This is the last of these sort of talks that are going to happen in this series. And there's a reason why the weather changes. There's a reason why the climate shifts. So there's a reason why there's a chilling effect on things. You know, it doesn't come out of nowhere. It comes out of thousands of little decisions, one after another, and then we decide to be complicit with them. We decide to cooperate with them. And so I, um, I want to thank everyone for, uh, for, for, for allowing me to talk, considering especially that I am a dilettante and know very, very little about healthcare, as you can tell by looking at the shape of my body. But I do appreciate the opportunity to think out loud. And I appreciate very greatly the opportunity to be in a room with a group of people talking about an unpleasant and uncomfortable subject, which I find, as a monologist, I often use those in my trade. And it's increasingly rare in public discourse. And the fact that it was this unpleasant for this long, that it sits right on our nerves, is a very good sign that we actually have our thumb on something that's vitally, vitally important. Thank you.
what art is in our age, if, if you didn't know. Um, but you probably do know because you're the kind of people who come to this conference. You're probably well versed in, in the, the intricacies of art. Um, you're, in fact, the, the engaged people, you know. What's interesting, of course, is that we're having this conversation, and, and we've all uh, alluded to, and at a point that has been elided a number of times, is that there's this huge unspoken mass, um, you know, sort of like the dark matter of the universe, you know, like a giant ball of neutrinos out there. Uh, something that is hanging over the earth. Those people who are not here are, in fact, the people who are, you know, in the system. Like, I suspect a large number of people here are going to have living wills, or if they don't have living wills now, they'll be getting them later. Um, uh, probably after they finish up here, they'll go home. Because you seem like good people who follow the rules. You'll probably uh, make arrangements and think about the nature of your death. Um, I'm maybe here to provide counterpoint, because I won't. Uh, do that. I'm going to leave and I'm going to try to forget I was here. Uh, I'm going to try to erase most of what happened today because, you know, it was unpleasant and um, the conversation was not comfortable for me. And uh, it made my wife very uncomfortable, uh, which makes a lot of sense because I am professionally fat. And as a professionally fat person, um, I'm going to die. You know, I mean, we're all actually going to die, a point that's been hammered home again and again and again and again today uh, with a lot of uh, ceaseless regularity for a culture that, that hates it, but we are apparently all the people who love to talk about death. Uh, we're all going to die. Uh, the point of being a professionally fat person is that I am that which will die before you. So sort of like all those jokes where people are being chased by a bear, you know, all these bear chasing jokes. If you've ever gone up to Canada, they love these fucking bear chasing jokes. There's a whole school of bear chasing jokes and all of them basically, if you boiled them down to their essence, the essence of every uh, bear chasing joke is uh, you're running with someone else. You don't need to outrun the bear. I just need to outrun this guy I'm with. And then, then the bear presumably eats that person. There, there's a whole universe. The Canadians don't have a deep sense of humor, but they do. They do have a lot of verisimilitude in one area, and that would be these bear jokes. Um, so there's a huge variety of them, but really all of them revolve around someone else. Uh, so the bear catching the other person. Um, the idea is that I will die before you, and so if you anthropomorphize death, and I think a lot of us do even if we don't admit it to ourselves, uh, if you think of death as we are really privileged, honored, delighted, I suppose is the main word, to have Mike Daisy here, uh, who will give a monologue. Uh, he is going to be doing, he's been doing all sorts of terrific things uh, recently, uh, the agony and the ecstasy of Steve Jobs, of course, but uh, after that, American Utopia is all over the country. And then, uh, starting September 5th, September 3rd, September 5th, for every single day, he's going to do a new monologue called All the Faces of the Moon, doing a month-long new monologue at the Public Theater. Tickets go on sale right after July 4th weekend, and you would be crazy to miss any of those faces of the moon. So anyway, without further ado, here's Mike. We should begin by making it clear that I'm not qualified to be here. Um, that's actually essential to understanding everything that follows, because um, sort of the essence of the gathering today generally involves qualified people, because that is sort of the mise en scene when you're setting up a conference, uh, you know, a, a cabinet, a wonder, as a force out there to be evaded, something to be um, cheated, perhaps, even, uh, or at least maybe have its form scrambled so it doesn't quite arrive exactly when it thought it was going to, that perhaps you could take a certain pill or have one of those proton beams shot through you in an enormous machine the size of an entire building. If all those things could be done and give you just a few more weeks, perhaps, because the beam's protons have scrambled death's address book and it can't quite find you at that moment, <laughs> that would be not such a bad thing. That's what I think people think. And in that way of thinking, it can occur to you that perhaps, perhaps if you are surrounded by a, a sufficient number of uh, fat people, that they will take up death's time before you. I, I find that people in our culture hate fat people with a, a really an intensity that people who've never been fat 
really don't uh, like they really hate fat people and um uh, uh and it's an interesting thing to experience and one of the things it teaches you though is that one of the areas that they um that they enjoy fat people is the the very certain knowledge that they'll they'll die first um they have none of this kind as, as you probably are well aware you are the kind of people who would go uh, i can tell by the fact that you are here and i saw some of you earlier and I felt the tenor of the room. And the tenor of the room was the tenor of a room full of people having a conversation they don't want to have, but they are the kind of people who are willing to go anyway, which puts them in a minority in the, the culture that we live in today. And, um, and, and, and the, the general tenor of the conversation, you know, was one of uh, expertness as people who know what the fuck they're talking about, one after another, would speak at length about the fact that they did understand what they were saying. Um, this is not to denigrate them least. I mean, I believe that they did. I believe they do know what they're talking about, and, and I heard it very clearly. And this presented a problem for me, uh, the monologuist, because as you can tell, having a title that is invented, uh, my job is largely fictitious. Uh, I, I am an artist, and uh, if you aren't aware, art is uh, uh, something uh, that is viewed with a sort of a mild antipathy by the dominant culture that we live in, uh, sort of like a distasteful, uh, like, like a side salad you never really wanted, but it came with the dish anyway, is sort of 